displaced is a beautiful, sometimes harrowing, but always perceptive and deeply moving anthology. So let me just begin by asking simply, how did this book come about? What was the genesis of this project? Thanks, Jack, and th good afternoon, Ithaca. It's such a pleasure to be back here. Um, the genesis of the book is actually pretty interesting because it wasn't my idea. It was actually the idea of uh, Jameson Stoltz, who's the editor for Abrams Books. And what happened, if you remember, was that there was the effort to do a Muslim ban a couple of years ago. And Jameson lives in New York City. He was quite upset about that. He participated in, in the protests that were happening at the airport at LaGuardia in New York. And then he discovered something that he didn't know, which was that his wife was a refugee from the Soviet Union. I think he knew that she was from the Soviet Union, of course, but that the whole issue of, of, of her technically being a refugee had, had just not come up, which meant that he was married to a refugee, his, his boys were the children of refugees, and so this intersection of his own personal beliefs but his family uh, history turned the question of refugees into to an urgent matter for him, maybe more urgent matter than it already was. So he approached me and said, do you want to do a book on, on refugee writers? And I said, of course. And so he found half the writers, I found half the writers. But the really crucial decision that we made is that this would be a book of, by refugee writers about refugee lives. So it would not be a book of interviews or oral histories of people who are refugees. Because if we, if we took that route, we would have an unlimited number of sources that we could draw from because the UNHCR, uh, UN High Commission on Refugees, estimates that there are around 69 million displaced people in the world right now, which if you think about it in terms of countries, is a population larger than the size of France. And of this 69 million people or so, there are about 23 million people officially classified as refugees. Now that classification is a very, very, <coughs> very important one because what's the distinction between a displaced person and a refugee? It's a sort of a crucial issue to figure out. And, and who do we even think of as refugees? Um, so when we put together this book, we, we, we thought about that. Like who, who, who is officially classified as a refugee? So in considering these writers, you know, one of the people I deliberately asked to be a part of this was uh, is a writer named Reina Grande, you know, author of several books, and technically would be classified as an undocumented immigrant. She came across the border from, from Mexico. But I asked her to write because, for me, that line between an undocumented immigrant and a refugee is a very thin one. Right? We, 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 we as a country do not wish to classify many of these people coming from south of the border as refugees because if we did so, we would grant them a certain kind of status under UN conventions, we would acknowledge that they are fleeing from conditions that are akin to war. And as a matter of fact, in Reina's piece, she points out that she comes from Chiapas, where the death rate is actually, from, from various kinds of violence around drug warfare and things like this, is actually higher than it is in many war-torn countries. So we wanted to you know, get people who actually live these kinds of lives and who could write about them. Because one of the ways by which refugees become refugees is that they lose their voice. Not that they can't speak, they speak all the time like we do, but they aren't heard. And part of the way that they become dehumanized in the eyes of those who are not refugees is that they don't have the capacity to speak for themselves. Right? So it was important not simply to have people who are witnesses to their own experience to tell us their, their terrible life stories or their, or their dramatic human stories, but to have writers who could write their own stories and in that way assert what they already had, their humanity, but, what, but which was a point that would need to be reinforced. Right? So we, we have writers, we have 19 different contributors in the paperback edition writing from, uh, coming from the Soviet Union, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Chile, Mexico, Ethiopia, Bosnia, Hungary, Iran, Ukraine, Zimbabwe, and Laos. And that doesn't include the countries they had to cross in order to eventually make it to their countries of settlement. So these essays, some of them were written, were they commissioned, um, um, or were they, or both? I think we only reprinted a, a couple of, of, of essays from other sources, but otherwise they were all commissioned. Okay. Um, they were all original work done by these writers. Um, and they share, a, despite the fact that they're coming from all these different historical experiences and countries and cultures, there are common themes mm -hmm. that emerge through their work. So for example, you know, if you read my, my opening, one of the themes in there is memory. 
-hmm. and not just what we remember, but what we, what we don't remember. And this is a big theme through through many of these works. Many of these um, writers came as refugees when they were children, mm -hmm. right? So their their memories are often inadequate of what they'd actually been through. So writing becomes a kind of a reconstruction, um, a reconstruction both of what they remember and what they don't remember. So one theme, for example, is a recitation of what it is that the writer doesn't remember of what they've been through, but what's, what their families have been through. I do this, Marin Hedera does this in her essay about coming from Ethiopia and going to Germany. And then her essay is about reconstructing her trip. She went to Germany as, as a child of about four years old. And then she, in her essay, returns to the place of her transit through Germany, through a small town, then I can't even remember, and visits the landscape that, that, um, that, that her parents had remembered, her parents had experienced, but which she could not recall. So can I ask you, so that um, everyone here gets a sense of both the book and your experience, to read the first two pages of the introduction? Yes, so here it is. I was once a refugee, although no one would mistake me for being a refugee now. Because of this, I insist on being called a refugee, since the temptation to pretend that I'm not a refugee is strong. It would be so much easier to call myself an immigrant, to pass myself off as belonging to a category of migratory humanity that is less controversial, less demanding, and less threatening than the refugee. I was born a citizen and a human being. At four years of age, I became something less than human, at least in the eyes of those who do not think of refugees as being human. The month was March, the year 1975, when the Northern Communist Army captured my hometown of Ban Me Thuot in its final invasion of the Republic of Vietnam, a country that no longer exists except in the imagination of its global refugee diaspora of several million people, a country that most of the world remembers as South Vietnam. Looking back, I remember nothing of the experience that turned me into a refugee. It begins with my mother making a life and death decision on her own. My, my father was in Saigon, and the lines of communication were cut. I do not remember my mother fleeing our hometown with my 10-year-old brother and me, leaving behind our 16-year-old adopted sister to guard the family property. I do not remember my sister who my parents would not see again for nearly 20 years, who I would not see again for nearly 30 years. My brother remembers dead paratroopers hanging from the trees on our route, although I do not. I also do not remember whether I walked the entire 184 kilometers to Nha Trang, or whether my mother carried me, or whether we might have managed to get a ride on the cars, trucks, carts, motorcycles, and bikes crowding the road. Perhaps she does remember that I never asked about the exodus or about the tens of thousands of civilian refugees and fleeing soldiers or the desperate scramble to get on a boat in Nyajang or some of the soldiers shooting civilians to clear their way to boats, as I would read later in accounts of this time. I do not remember finding my father in Saigon or how we waited for another month until the communist army came to the city's borders or how we tried to get into the airport and then into the American embassy, and then finally somehow far away through the crowds at the docks to reach a boat, or how my father became separated from us but decided to get on a boat by himself anyway, and how my mother decided to do the same thing, or how eventually we were reunited on a larger ship. I do remember that we were incredibly fortunate finding our way out of the country, as so many millions did not, and not losing anyone, as so many thousands did. No one except my sister. For most of my life, I did remember soldiers on our boat firing onto a smaller boat full of refugees that was trying to approach. But when I mentioned it to my older brother many years later, he said the shooting never happened. I do not remember many things, and for all those things I do not remember, I'm grateful. Because the things I do remember hurt me enough. My memory begins after our stops at a chain of American military bases in the Philippines Guam, and finally, Pennsylvania. To leave the refugee camp in Pennsylvania, the Vietnamese refugees needed American sponsors. One sponsor took my parents, another took my brother, a third took me. Thank you. There's a lot to unpack there, and I'd like to come back to the experience of being separated 
from your parents, but I wanted to start at the beginning of that section. Um, there are symbolic and legal distinctions between the terms refugee, migrant, immigrant, as you suggested. Uh, why is it um, that some categories are less controversial, less demanding, and less threatening, as you say? What is it about refugees in the popular imaginary um, that makes them different? Well, you know, we call ourselves a country of immigrants. That's a part of our mythology. That's a part of the American dream. And even though, as a country, we've gone through moments of intense xenophobia against immigrants, such as this very moment that we're living in, that mythology of immigration is still very strong. And I think even for those Americans who oppose immigration, they recognize the importance of that mythology, that they have to work against that mythology in order to create exclusionary laws or exclusionary policies. And I think Americans understand the idea of immigration because we, of course, think immigrants want to come to this country. We're the land of the American dream. Of course people would want to be here. So the idea of immigration into the country is something that we're uh, capable of accepting. Refugees are different. Um, and refugees are different not because they're migratory beings who want to come here, but because they embody something that is antithetical to the American dream. So if the American dream is, is based at least partly on immigration, it is also based on rejecting the very possibility that Americans can become refugees. I'll give you an example of that, which is that uh, 130,000 Vietnamese refugees came to this country in 1975, and some of them were resettled in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And then 30 years later, Hurricane Katrina happens, tens of thousands of people are displaced, and some of the American media call these people refugees. And President George Bush says, it's un-American to call these people refugees. Mm -hmm and a lot of them are African Americans. And so for perhaps the only time in history, Jesse Jackson agrees with George Bush <laughs> and says it's racist to call African Americans refugees. I thought, great. We refugees have succeeded in bringing America together in hating us. <laughs> so when we think of, of refugees, what do we think of? We think of people who, who are coming from broken, broken countries, from failed states, and therefore, we as Americans can never become refugees because we as a country can never be a failed state. Now, history would seem to indicate otherwise. If we think about Katrina and what happened, if we think about Hurricane Maria and what happened in Puerto Rico, we are perfectly capable as a country of collapsing in various ways. But refugees are dangerous to us. It's even more than the threat of contamination that they bring in terms of illness or, or disease or things like this. Refugees are dangerous psychologically because they bring a fear that we might one day ourselves become refugees. And so, so you know, I think we want to keep them out. We want to keep them out of our country, but we also want to keep them out of our, our, our psyche as well. Um, so in the, in the Venn diagram of identity, there, there's overlap between immigrant and refugee and person of color and so on. Um, you know, as an immigrant reading this book, I, I recognize many of the feelings of longing and loss, for example. Um, but is there something that is um, unique to the experience of being a refugee that distinguishes being a refugee from those other categories? Is there something about being a refugee that psychologically or otherwise that is that marks the refugee differently? So, so to be an immigrant typically means you're making a very strategic choice over time. You've thought about why you want to leave your country, where you want to go, and you've gone through various processes uh, of making that happen, legal processes, right? So an immigrant is a voluntary person, a person who moves voluntarily and strategically, and if done legally, the immigrant is someone who is technically welcomed into the country that he or she chooses. So a refugee is different than that. And so a refugee is, is, is related to an undocumented immigrant because in both cases, oftentimes, th there is no choice. The action is not voluntary to leave. In, in the case of my family, obviously, we fled wartime conditions. So you're driven out by, by oftentimes by desperation, whether it's hunger or whether it's war or the causes like this. And 
oftentimes the arrival in another country is not so much a choice, but a, a, but at best a desperate choice. You just you just want to go anywhere. It it, you, know, so you may or may not want to come to the United States. You just want to end up anywhere. And then maybe the last condition is that to be a refugee is that oftentimes you're moving as part of a large mass of people. It's not just typically one person who becomes a refugee or a dozen. It's tens of thousands of people who become refugees. So this distinguishes us, for example, from exiles. You know, exiles are a little more glamorous, right? You're, 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 you're forced out of your country, but you, you know, you're, you're forced because you've done something individually that makes you victim to the state, like you're, you're a dissident writer or something like this. So there's more glamour associated with being an exile. But with refugees, it's these mass conditions of forced displacement, and there's nothing glamorous about that. And so part of what we associate with refugees is not, you know, Ellis Island or Angel Island, but refugee camps. Refugee camps are very different than Ellis Island or Angel Island, even though these places also have their histories of detention and, and some very negative um, experiences too. But refugee camps, if you think about it, what, what, what kinds of images do we have of refugee camps? We have mass tent camps of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who are living under desperate conditions. Um, maybe people out there believe that somehow in a refugee camp it's a vacation and, and you know, you're being given stuff. But if you read accounts of refugee camps, you know, what you hear is that these are conditions of bare sustenance, of bare life, where people are being given barely enough food to live. You know, the social structures of the family are being destroyed by these, by these mass conditions. Um, everything, that reminds, everything that we take for granted as human beings, beginning with adequate sewage, and toilets are not, do not exist in refugee camps. This is a common theme of people who come out of refugee camps, what they talk about. You know, part of the dehumanization is being forced to live with your own filth and being aware that this is, is a reminder of the fact that you've been degraded and that the people who are in charge of your existence do not think more highly enough of you to allow you to have the same kind of conditions that we would take for granted in our, in our, um, in our privileged lives as citizens. Uh, some of the things you're saying reminds me of a line from Lev Golinkin's essay where he says, it's the brutal little difference between subjects and direct objects. Once you've made the transition from when are we eating to when are they feeding us, you know you're a refugee. So it seems like it goes to the question of agency, right? There's a difference. In and that's why the, the question of writing was so important. The kinds of images that we see of refugees in mass media, in, in, on TV or, or documentation, documentaries and so on, render them as objects. Mm -hmm. um, and write, writing is an act of agency, it's an act of subjectivity, it's an act of voice. And in these mass media depictions of, of refugees, they have, they have no voice. They're being talked over by the journalist who's telling us something about these refugees, and de you know, even as we're trying to, you know, maybe they're, they're being shown as, as objects of pity, but they're still objects. Mm -hmm. And so from my own experience, for example, I look back on, on the last major refugee crisis we had, which was my refugee crisis, the crisis of the Vietnamese, but also the Cambodians and the Laotians from the 1970s. And so many of these people, especially the Vietnamese and the ethnic Chinese from Vietnam, fled by boat from, from, from Vietnam. And what were they called? They were called boat people. So even to this day, globally, they're known as boat people. Even I went to, I went to France. The French don't like you know, using English language words, but they will use boat people to talk about the Vietnamese refugees. And I resist that so much because of its objectification mm -hmm. of the people who are fleeing right. that country. Right. Because you have to remember, most of the people who decided to flee by boat from Vietnam knew in advance that the odds were terrible. They knew that their odds were probably about one in one, you know, 50-50 of surviving this trip, which is actually true. You know, UNHCR estimates that only half of the people who set out by boat made it to another shore. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who disappeared on the seas. That's a heroic decision from my point of view. And if we were to approach it from the refugees' point of view, they would see that as heroic as well. Uh, but rendered from the outside, from the perspective of the journalists or from, from those of us who are watching from other countries, they become pitiful objects. Right. right. Um, Chris Abani touches on that in his essay, The Road, where he asks, have you ever noticed that the quintessential image for the refugee, the photographs we have come to identify with the condition, always has the refugee in flight? 
The refugee is always on the road somewhere, on a boat somewhere, in a plane somewhere, on a train somewhere, never arriving. And um, Lev Golenkin again, to quote him, he says, the drastic images which make newsreels create the impression that people turn into refugees overnight. In my family's experience, that isn't true. Becoming a refugee is a gradual process of bleaching out a transition into a ghostly existence. With the exception of those born in refugee camps, every refugee used to have a life. It doesn't matter whether you were a physician in Bosnia or a goat herder in the Congo, what matters is that a thousand little anchors once moored you to the world. Becoming a refugee means watching as those anchors are severed of a new life. So do you think we focus too much in the popular imaginary on the journey, on the escape story, and, and what does that obscure? Well, I think we do, because that's where, that's where most of the drama lies, right? The, the story of life and death. And um, it makes for good images, obviously, as, as Chris brings up. Um, what is more difficult to deal with is the life in the refugee camp, which can last for months to years or decades, for, for example, is that we included an account of, of Palestinian refugees as well. And that's the, the, the most volatile refugee issue um, that we have in the world today, um, where people have literally been born into camps and, and have stayed there for, for decades. And so that experience of the enduring existence of, of refugees, I think, is even more, more disturbing than, the, than the, the voyage. Because when we see the voyage, you know, we can feel pity. When we see a boy lying face down on the beach, we can feel pity for a moment. But if we have to think about people living in these in-between conditions of the refugee camp for decades, it's, it's more disturbing because we have to try to figure out a solution, and the solution can be very terrible. Um, or when the refugees actually come to their country of settlement, like here in the United States, they, their, their resettlement process, their, their, their extended journey into becoming a part of this country can also be very arduous and very difficult. And if we, and if we look at that, it might, it might make us even more uncomfortable. So for example, a lot of refugees who come to this country have already been subject to the narrative of the American dream. They watch Hollywood movies too. They have this fantasy of what life is like in the United States. What life is like in the United States in Hollywood is not what life is actually like in the United States. And refugees usually do not get put into Beverly Hills. You know, refugees usually get put into the so-called inner city, so-called ghettos, and it's a shock for them to to discover that this is where they they belong, or where they this is where Americans think that they belong. And so their account of these experiences can be disturbing to us as well as we're forced to confront the existence of ghettos, of inner cities, which are homologous to refugee camps, right? Uh, that in fact, it's not such an easy boundary between the United States and some other country. Other countries have their beautiful metropolitan urban areas and terrible areas of poverty, and so do we. And we route refugees from one country, no matter where they came from, maybe they were doctors or whatever in this other country, but we put them into, initially, oftentimes, a ghetto instead. So to go back to your introduction and your own resettlement experience, you talked about uh, being separated from your family, and, and um, it was under more uh, benevolent circumstance. Perhaps you could tell us about that experience of separation. So in order to leave these camps as refugees, you had to have a sponsor, like I said. And the point of that was to prevent us from becoming drains on the American welfare state and to, uh, in, in the case of my parents, allow them time to, to get back on their feet. Um, so what happened to our family was apparently pretty unusual because I tell this story to other Vietnamese people and they're shocked too. They're like, that didn't happen to us. Because <laughs> usually what would happen is that a sponsor would take an entire family. The sponsor would be in another American family or an American individual or a church, something like this. So for whatever reason, I still don't understand to this day what happened, but my parents went to one sponsor, my brother to another, and, and I went to a third, and I was four years of age. And so this is where my memories begin, howling and screaming as I was taken away from my parents, because I, obviously when you're four, you do not understand what the bureaucrat is telling you, that this is for your own good. You only understand the separation. And that experience, I think, has always stayed with me, even though I tried to deny it. So, you know, to, func to function, 
you know, after this experience, I think for many people, we, we try to put the trauma behind us. We try to live normal lives and so on. We try to forget the past. And yet, I think for whatever reason, that memory of that always stayed with me like an invisible brand stamped between my shoulder blades. And if I were to psychoanalyze myself, which I don't do because I'm a writer, um, if I were to do that, if I look back, I think this is one of the originary moments that produced the screwed up person that I am that turned me into a writer. Uh, you know, I'd like to say that you know, being a refugee wasn't all bad because it gave me the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. I'm grateful for that. Um, but I think when my, when my son was born, and he turned four years old about a year and a half ago, looking at him was the occasion for me to, to see myself in him and to think back on that time and to think how painful it would be, it must have been, for me to be separated from my parents um, as it would be for him to be separated from me. But also more than that, I could finally see my parents in this whole experience. And to, you know, if I, my son was taken away from me, it would be incredibly painful. So. That allowed me to empathize even more with my parents and what, what they must have uh, been through, um, even though the separation was only for about three months on my part. And my, my, but my brother, who was 10 years old, uh, didn't come home for two years. You know. And this is, this is how, he likes to say to me, we know mom and dad love you more. <laughs> um, so, uh, but he was fine. He was fine. He went to Harvard. So it's all good. <laughs> Uh, and you've written about this, but obviously this experience informed your own reaction to the policy of family separation mm -hmm. at the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah. It's very interesting. I was at the State Department, because I was invited to go to the State Department to, to talk about uh, it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, so I was invited to speak about that. Um, and it was very interesting. They, they, they wanted to know what I was going to talk about, so I said, I'm going to talk about this variety of things, including what we're just discussing. And, you know, comparing what happened to me, the emotional pain of being separated from one's family with what's happening at our southern border and separation of, of families from their children. And I said, I'm also going to be talking about, you know, genocide, slavery, and colonization. And they said, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe you shouldn't talk about all those things. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, I won't talk about genocide, slavery, and colonization. I said, no. Maybe you shouldn't talk about separating families from their children. And I thought, that's what you're upset about? That's what I can't say at the State Department because the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State was going to be present. And <laughs> in fact, he was. He introduced me. And so it's, it's weird how that, that is the policy mm -hmm. that is too politically sensitive, too uncomfortable to, to raise um, at the State Department. Um, but I think it's true. I think that, and, and maybe this is why it's sensitive, it's, it's, we know that whatever bureaucratic legal justification we have for doing this, we all know that this is incredibly emotionally destructive to do to people, to separate families, to take away children, and more than that, to lose children right. as well. I mean, that's still an unsettled matter. There's right. still thousands of children who have not been reunited with their families. Um, and so, to me, the fact that this policy even happened, that people thought this would be a good idea, that people implemented this, means that the bureaucrats who came up with this do not think of these people as human beings. You know, for them it's a technical matter. It's like, well, uh, you know, we're just going to think of these people as a category as undocumented immigrants or illegal immigrants, whatever, you, whatever they, they want to call them. And, we're, and because we think of them in this way, we don't have to think of them as, as human beings who can feel things just like we would. Um, so I want to make sure there's time for all of you to ask questions. And uh, time has gone by really quickly. If only asked a few of the things I hope to talk about. But on that subject of uh, the perception of refugees and their humanity, something that was really interesting when you wrote The Sympathizer is that you said you did not want to write the book as a way of explaining the humanity of the Vietnamese. You said that rather than writing a book that tries to affirm humanity, which is typically the position that minority writers are put into, the book starts from the assumption that we are human and then goes on to prove that we're also inhuman at the same time. So, you know, by showing the inhumanity of, of all the characters you're revealing by extension, their, their full humanity. But I wonder, in this moment, uh, in this current political moment, where we have all of this bad hombre rhetoric in the air, 
is it possible to do that fully to to show the inhumanity of the refugee or is it still a strategic necessity to argue for their humanity because you know at the beginning of your introduction you you say I was born a citizen and a human being and, you know to remind us mm -hmm. Can you do the same thing as you did in the sympathizer with all representations of the refugee in this current political climate? Either? Well, I think basically the answer is no. Yeah. Okay, so I, I occupy different functions in my life, whether I happen to be a professor or an editor or a novelist or an advocate or someone writing for the New York Times and so on. And so as a novelist, I can be as difficult of a human being as I want to be. Right. This is my artistic vision. I'm going to insist on, on the, the, the simultaneity of humanity, inhumanity. I'm not going to translate for you. You've got you to come and meet me where I'm speaking from. That doesn't work so well when you're trying to be an advocate for refugees, right? And when you're also trying to edit a book with 19 other writers involved in it. So I think the, the displaced exists on the borderline between what you're talking about. It, it definitely veers towards asserting humanity asserting advocacy for refugees, telling you 19 individual different stories from very different places about the humanity of these people. But let me point out that there's also you know, pieces in here that bring up the inhumanity that refugees do to each other or people who, from the original, from the countries of origin, the inhuma inhumanity that gets done there. So, so for example, you know, going back to Reina Grande's piece, um, her piece is entitled The Parent Who Stays. What she's talking about there is that her parents made this very difficult decision to, to leave Mexico to become undocumented immigrants, to come to this country as laborers in order to try to make a better life for their family in Mexico. And the irony of all that is that they destroyed the family in the process of trying to save it. All of the familial bonds between parents and children that you would normally expect have been eradicated because the parents were not there while the children were growing up. The father is a laborer in the United States and becomes an alcoholic to survive. Finally, they get Reina to come to, this, to, the, to the United States. It's over by then. There are no more emotional bonds left. The father's an alcoholic. They're no, they're no longer close. The upshot of all of that is the final affirmation of her story is that she gets to be the parent who stays. She gets to have children, have them live with her in her house. But the memory of what her father had to go through and the destruction of the family bond is completely wrapped up in this. Or Alexander Hamon's account. Alexander Hamon is a Bosnian refugee, excellent writer, but his project is actually one of the few in the book that is, is an oral history. So he goes and he interviews all these Bosnian refugees, and the one that he has for this book is an account of a man who lives basically the story of Job from the Bible, or Candide by Voltaire, you know. An unimaginable string of horrifying things. That, you know, it's unbelievable this could happen in one person's life. But the, the fact that these things happen means that you know, somebody did very inhuman things to him, people from his own country. Right? And so these stories can force us to confront the inhumanity that people have done to each other, which is no, no different than the inhumanity that we have done to others, the inhumanity that we're doing at, the very, at this very moment on our border. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open things up for questions from the audience. I've always had the sense that there was a spectrum of how people were described depending on who they were fleeing. So the traditionally people who were fleeing communism were refugees publicly because they were fleeing something awful and seeking freedom in the United States. Whereas you mentioned Palestinian refugees and that term is very rarely applied in public discourse because it would both raise the question who's persecuting them, what are they fleeing from, and also it would undo the whole idea of them as menacing terrorists. So it seemed, and so the word refugee is not used for them. I was just wondering. No, that's what I'm saying. I mean, refugees on the one hand, it, it, it's, it's an official classification by the UN. There's various conditions you have to meet to be a refugee, but it's obviously also, it's, 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 deeply politicized, right? right? And I'll give you another example that's, a, that's related to one, what you just brought up, um, which is that m many of those people who have come here officially as refugees are not actually sympathetic to new refugees right. trying to get into this country. Mm -hmm. David Besmoskis brings this up in his bit on uh, 
Arab refugees from the Soviet, uh, not, uh, is it David, David, David Moses? Somebody brings this up, talking about, um, you know, refugees from the Soviet Union who have no sympathy for new ones that are coming over. Because they say, you know, we, we were the good refugees, exactly. you know, these are the bad refugees. And Vietnamese people will say exactly the same thing. And I know this, I take this very personally, you know, because I'm Vietnamese too. And when I look back at our history, you know, what, the, the one, what I point out is in 1975, the majority of Americans did not want to accept Vietnamese refugees or Cambodian or Laotian refugees. Only through an act of Congress were we allowed into this country. And why did Congress pass this act? Probably because they were feeling guilty, but also it was good politics. We were going to accept refugees from Vietnam, just as we accepted refugees from Cuba, because we would prove that we're awesome, communism is bad. And now, of course, it's not awesome to, to take in brown, red, brown skinned refugees or, or Muslims or, or Arabs and so on. The politics are different in this regard. So yes, the refugee exists in a very political environment, uh, both in terms of who, who, whether or not we as a country call people refugees and whether we ourselves call ourselves refugees. You know, many refugees, besides denying entrance to new refugees don't want to call themselves refugees either because they know it's a stigma. They know it consciously or unconsciously. That's why many refugees pass themselves off as immigrants and may themselves not really understand the distinction between the two, which is even more of a reason for me to call myself a refugee. Yes. What do you think about children that are unaccompanied minors? And I know, I mean, the parents must think they're going to give a better life to their kids. And I know there was something in the 60s called Operation Peter Pan, where the children from, boys, I guess, from Cuba were sent to the US to live with families away from their parents. And so I, I just want to know your views on these children that are sent by their parents in the hopes of a better life. Yeah, and it happens all the time. So in, in my history, for example, what happened in Vietnam in the, you know, the late 70s and early 80s, what these children were called, these un unaccompanied minors were called, they were called anchors. And that's still used today, right? Anchor babies. But anchors in the sense that a family would send one, two, or more children by themselves off in a refugee boat in the hopes that this child or children would eventually make it to a safe haven and be the anchor that would pull the rest of the family across. And sometimes this was successful. I mean, there are success stories uh, that have happened um, as a result. Sometimes it is not, because as you can imagine, it's terrifying to show up in a, in, a, in a foreign country not speaking the language when you're 12 years old, let's say. And in the success stories, you know, it's a combination of luck, perseverance, finding someone, a sponsor who, who will help this person. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And sometimes it doesn't happen because of other complicated reasons. I'll give you another example. Some of these um, unaccompanied minors, uh, for example, were mixed race children. Um, now, if you were a mixed-race child and your father was white, your fate was better than if your father was black. You know, so a lot of these you know, Amerasians who were African-Americans, Amer African basically, discovered in this country that not only they're subjected to anti-refugee feelings, but they're subjected to anti-black racism, both on the part of Americans, but also on the part of their, their, their fellow Vietnamese refugee community. So the, the whole issue of unaccompanied minors is exactly this. It's, 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 it's a situation born out of, out, of, out of desperation. No family wants to send their child off you know, in, by themselves or with a sibling in order to do this. Many of them don't survive the journey. And then when they get to the country of origin, they face very, very daunting odds. Yeah. Many refugees wouldn't be refugees if it weren't for things that America had done to their own countries, such as Vietnam, the so-called hill people of Vietnam who were employees of the American government suddenly abandoned the translators and other employees of the American armies in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on and so on and so on. What is the experience of people who have to get out of their country because of things Americans have done to their countries and they come to America? Well, that's actually, you know, a very common experience. So, uh, um, well, where to begin? Um, I mean, what, the, uh, the, the, what, what, I mean, some refugees would say, and immigrants too, you know, we would not be here if you weren't over there, right? And, and that's, so I think for Americans, it's, it's, it's hard to recognize that relationship, okay? Because obviously, 
if Americans were to recognize these kinds of relationships, Americans would have to confront their own wars overseas and the, and the consequences of those wars. And so much of my work has been to say that we can't separate war stories from refugee stories. As a country, we want to, because it makes it easier for us as a country if we separate war stories from refugee stories, because it allows two different mythologies to exist at the same time. You know, one mythology around war stories is that wars happen over there and that they're easily contained. Okay. So for example, uh, the Vietnam War begins for Americans in 1964, ends in 1975, that's it. And that allows us to contain the meaning of a war geographically and temporally so that we can move on. And then we as a country don't have to deal with our own consequences because wars, in fact, don't end simply because we say they do. If they ended simply because we said they do, then we wouldn't have PTSD. We wouldn't have thousands of American soldiers committing suicide in the decades after the war. Um, if we acknowledge these things, we would have to take the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and build a couple more walls to consecrate all the names of American soldiers who killed themselves later. So, so, so by separating wars from, from, from what happens here, we make it easier for us to both mourn the wars of the past and to fight the wars of the future. Refugees, by cutting them off from the history of war, what we, all, what we also do is turn refugees into immigrants. So we can just deal with Vietnamese or Cambodians or Laotians, just to use your example, from the moment they arrive on American soil. And then we can just put them in the narrative of the American dream. We don't have to think about the fact that they were here because we fought wars over there and then we broke our promises to them and didn't actually stay until the bitter end, which is what the United States said that it would do, and rescue them, which is what the United States said they would do. So we re the United States rescued hundreds of thousands of people and left behind millions of people who had fought on the side of the United States. So I think it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary to bring together war stories and refugee stories in order for us to understand that we can't separate the so-called civilian consequences from the consequences of war. Whether we're talking about civilians from other countries coming here, or whether we're talking about soldiers of our own side who become civilians and then whom we conveniently forget about once a war is finished. I think anybody here that's got Irish blood in them have to realize that the Irish were refugees too. They came due to violence and famine. That, that's why they came here. And then they were restricted here. If you see an Irish settlement road, that's where they were allowed to live. So they had very restricted areas where they were allowed to farm and live. But uh, what's going on in Honduras is very much what was going on in Ireland in the 1800s. So I recommend everybody here refer, refer to their Irish friends as being refugees. Because <laughs> there's a wake-up call needed there. Right, right. Well, it's part of the, that narrative of, of assimilation and, 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 and amnesia that you're talking about that obviously turn of the century or whatever, late 19th, early 20th century, Irish were racialized in, the, in their own way here in the United States. So we see the residue of that in, in certain kinds of Irish stereotypes. But nevertheless, 50 or 60 years later, you get John F. Kennedy. So then everything's cool. Um, <laughs> and so the, the erasure of that history that you're talking about, um, the poverty, the famine, the the refugee experience has, has become simply a part of the ethnic charm of the Irish. Uh, the question is whether, you know, this, this, what happened to the Irish can happen to other populations. Mm -hmm. This gets into the distinction of, you know, race versus ethnicity. The Irish became white. Um, By 1910, they became white. When yeah. the Italians yeah. started coming. Right, exactly. Irish, you know? right. <laughs> this is how whiteness works. You know, whiteness is very flexible. Like, you know what? Uh, ben Franklin was upset in the late 18th century about the Germans coming to Pennsylvania. Right. Um, so the flexibility of whiteness has meant that newer ethnic groups from Europe could become white, in so long as, as there were other darker ethnic Europeans coming right after them, you know, the Greeks and the Slavs and whatnot. And of course, after all that, uh, everybody who was from Europe became white because now we have Latinos and all and, and these so-called darker populations. So the, the whole issue is whether, I think this is one of the core questions for this country, is whether this process of assimilation works just as well as you're implying um, for people from Honduras, from people from south of the border, from people who are Arab refugees, Arab immigrants, or Arab Americans. That is precisely what's fracturing this country right now.
In your own life, um, I'm wondering how, for this book, for this project, if you interviewed your own parents and how they feel about the refugee um, situation for them. Did they, did they ever wish that they hadn't come, that they could have, things had been different, they could have stayed in Vietnam, and that they, did they go back, and did they visit the farm, and did they go back, and how you're, does it, how does it feel for them? You're asking me to talk to my parents. It's hard to talk to you. I know I never talked to my parents as, as adults. I always thought of them as parents and never mm -hmm. as, as a, a man, and, you know. Yeah. They were always my parents, so I never talked to them, and I'm yeah. just wondering if you had those in-depth conversations with them and how they felt about the whole situation. Uh, it's interesting because I think at one point in the last few years, you know, I asked my dad, you know, maybe we should, maybe, maybe we should do an interview. Mm. You know, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so growing up over time, over you know, over the last couple of, you know, over my time as an American, um, I would hear stories from my parents about the life in Vietnam and about the journey over. And they would always tend to be sort of the same stories over and over and over again. Um, and they were almost always bad stories. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it left me with a very ambivalent relationship to my parents' past in the sense that when I would ask them to elaborate or tell me certain things, sometimes they wouldn't. And I just didn't really understand what was permissible to ask them and what wasn't permissible to ask them. What did they want to talk about? What, they did, what did they not want to talk about? The traumatic stuff that they told me was pretty traumatic. Was there more traumatic stuff that they weren't, gonna, weren't telling me? Or why were they not telling me about the more banal stuff? Um, and so one of the reasons why I became an, a fiction writer first and foremost is that, and not a journalist, is that I don't like to talk to people. You know, uh, I like to imagine people instead. It makes it much easier when they don't talk back to me and contradict my, my version of things. But, you know, my parents, the, the question of whether my parents would have wanted to go back is an interesting one that I think was settled by the early 90s because what happened was, you know, from 1975 to 1994, the United States maintained an embargo on Vietnam and there was no legal way to, to go back to Vietnam directly from the United States. But in 1994, that embargo was ended. My parents immediately went back to Vietnam twice. And they had told me over the years um, that I was 100% Vietnamese. Okay. So then they go back twice. After the second time they return and over Thanksgiving, my dad says to me, we're Americans now. <laughs> so whatever they had seen in Vietnam uh, had transformed their understanding of themselves. And I think this is not unusual. You know, refugees and immigrants, especially refugees perhaps, because they're, they're forcibly cut off from their countries of origin, are very nostalgic about the countries of origin. Nostalgia is literally homesickness, right? And so they, they, they create a certain vision of the country of origin that's fixed in time, in this case, to 1975. And that vision is fixed to themselves as to who they are. And then when they go back to these countries of origin 20, 30 years later, they discover that the countries have changed and they have changed and the people have changed. And so they, they have to give up that attachment to that originary vision of, of the country. So I think that's very, to me, that's, that's, that's why I think the overwhelming majority of Vietnamese refugees have not gone back to Vietnam to live. I mean, some have a handful, some, a minority have gone back, to, but very, very few have done that. They've been so utterly changed by their American experience. And then when they go back to Vietnam, they, they for a lot of them, I think, they, they see a, a, a country that was even more complicated than the one that they, that they left, at least complicated for them. You know, in my family's case, most of our relatives are poor. So it's not a fun thing to go back to visit your poor relatives. Mm -hmm. Right, because your emotional relationships are saturated now by this complexity of resentment and obligation and expectation. That's, so it's, we don't get the fun tourist experience of Vietnam. All of you who go back to, who go to Vietnam, you will get the fun tourist experience of Vietnam. You will enjoy the country much more than I can because I have to go visit my relatives. And I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that I think is why, why it's not a sentimental experience for a lot of, a lot of Vietnamese refugees.
You started to talk about why having refugee writers actually be able to write their own stories was important. And I wondered if you could just say more about that. The way I became a writer is probably not unusual. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you my experience of how I became a writer. You know, no, number one, the, 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 the first reason why I became a writer is because I was a refugee. You know, my, I, I was a refugee, my parents worked all the time, they had no time to spend with me. So I grew up in the library. I read a lot of books. And these books had nothing to do with refugees, for the most part, or being Vietnamese or Asian. Um, as a matter of fact, there was, there was no, age, no children's Asian-American literature back in the 70s and the 80s, very, very little of that. And so I just fell in love with stories as a whole. That was the first impetus for becoming a writer. But the second impetus is, is also very common in the, for, for people like me who are so-called minorities in this country, which is the shock of discovering that I was different. You know, the, the, the love of literature, I think, is the love of discovering that you're the same, because you, you get immersed in this world and you, you identify with somebody else, some other character, and you're, you're lost in this, this journey. But the shock of difference is to discover that you're not a part of the story that you thought you were a part of. And for me, that was discovering the history of the Vietnam War. Um, for me, that was watching a lot of American movies about the Vietnam War. And I loved, I love war movies. I love American war movies. I identified with Americans. Didn't, didn't care that they were killing Krauts or Germans. No, that's not me. But watching American movies about the Vietnam War was very difficult because then the American soldiers were killing Vietnamese people and then I was separated in two. I was no longer the same. I was also somebody different from Americans. And so that, that shock of, of recognition or misrecognition of my own difference was the other impetus for becoming a writer. So one impetus, the love of stories, that's love. The other impetus was hate. I was like, I hate these American movies about the Vietnam War and I'm gonna take my revenge. I'm gonna become a writer so I can write against these represent misrepresentations. And that is, a very, again, a very common experience um, it just depends on what your, your so-called minority experience is, but we all experience that shock of understanding that we've been misrecognized, misrepresented, and we're going to have to become writers in order to, to fight against those misrepresentations. I'm just wondering about the Vietnamese refugee community, let's say, around the world. Uh, are you all like Bosnians? Do you know fellow Vietnamese refugees who live in France? fellow Vietnamese refugees who live maybe in South Africa, fellow Vietnamese refugees who are in Norway, or what do you just know American ones? Oh, no, I, I think it's definitely a global diaspora. I think, I think the figures are around four million Vietnamese people live in literally dozens of countries, and the larger con largest concentrations are in the countries you would suspect, the countries that have had intimate relations with Vietnam, for example. So surprisingly, the largest population is in Cambodia, because Cambodia is a neighboring country. And we have a very complicated, Vietnamese <laughs> people have a very complicated history with Cambodia because we, we took half of Cambodia into modern Vietnam, we colonized them, you know. Um, no one wants to talk about that. Uh, but then uh, France, Australia, Canada, Germany, uh, these are probably the other major countries with significant Vietnamese refugee populations. And so yes, of course, we're well aware of, of these other populations, that we often have relatives in different places. Um, and uh, in my capacity as an editor and as an advocate, you know, you know, uh, we try, my organization, Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, is built specifically around the idea that we have to make, make these connections between writers here and writers in other countries. I think what's really perplexing for, for most of us um, who live in these major, so-called major countries, is the fate of those Vietnamese people who ended up in places like Israel. You know, I mean, there, there are like literally dozens of countries and, and Vietnamese people have ended up in Israel, have ended up in small Pacific islands, and th their populations are in the hundreds. You know, at least here in the United States, we have the comfort of a million and a half or two million Vietnamese people. And so here in the United States, for example, we have actually very vibrant Vietnamese American literature in English. There's literally dozens of authors of Vietnamese descent who have at least one book from a major publisher. We're making big inroads. And we're all of the so-called 1.5 or second generation. We were born here, we were raised here. So as displaced as we might feel, at least we get to speak in English and write in English and be published by major New York publishing houses and get all the recognition that you would expect. Then you look at the fact that there are many 
Vietnamese writers in the United States who write in Vietnamese. And they're read only by their fellow Vietnamese people here or online in the diaspora. But they can't get published in Vietnam and they don't get translated here. So ironically, you know, the American publishing industry only translates 3% of its books per year, right? Um, and that's almost completely from countries outside of the United States. Well, what about all the countries inside the United States? I mean, we're, we're a multilingual country. And actually, you know, we're a country that has a long tradition of people writing in languages other than English in the United States. But these literatures don't get translated into English. So that's, that's I think, part of the pain of refugee and diasporic experience for people who speak, who live in the originary language, you realize that now you, you are, you are, your language is a minor language. In your homeland, your, your language was the major language, but in exile, your exiled language is the minor language, read and heard only by your fellow exiles or refugees or displaced people, not even by your own children or grandchildren. That's another level of pain in the refugee experience. I'm thinking about climate refugees, and I'm thinking if, say, the New York Times started referring to people in Honduras or um, that are fleeing gang violence as not as immigrants but as refugees, if we just started using that in in normal conversation or in newspaper articles, if we could just switch the narrative from something that sounds like they're coming here because they want to instead of they coming because they have to. If we right, you know, you go back to George Orwell and his essay, <laughs> Politics in the English Language, about the importance of choices of words, right? right. And actually, The Guardian, the, that newspaper, just published an article about its climate language. And it says, we're going to make a very conscious decision now that we're not going to refer to global warming anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to refer to global heating. Mm -hmm. Because that the one shift from warming to heating indicates the severity of, of what we're facing here. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to refer to climate skeptics anymore. We refer to climate change deniers. Mm -hmm. right. So I think you're right. Word choice reflects politics, which is what you know, Orwell is talking about. But maybe the last thing we can end on is this very difficult issue of climate change and, and refugees and the relationship between the two. Because obviously, um, so much of our focus has been on refugees who are fleeing starvation, poverty, war, and so on. And if now we're confronting the reality that whole you know, nations might be moving because of climate change, and we're in denial about that. And so I think the thing about both climate change and, or climate catastrophe, and refugees is that they force us to recognize connections that we want to deny. You know, we're responsible for climate catastrophe. Uh, we want to deny that. We, we want to deny the fact that when we turn on our engine, the consequences are going to be felt around the world. And when we look at refugees, we want to deny that they're here because we were there. So. Our ability to deal with either of these cri human crises is going to be based on our capacity to recognize our human connection, which so many of us would rather deny. Thank you very much.